There's very few movies that I would rank in my all-time favorite movies. Um, but one of those, and this is just a, it's a personal opinion. Everybody has them related to these things, so it doesn't mean that this is a better movie than anything else. But I really love a movie that Mel Gibson uh, directed and starred in called uh, The Patriot. And it's a story about the Martin family. Uh, he is Benjamin Martin. It's not a true story, um, but it's a great tale. And Benjamin Martin fought in the American Indian War and was a soldier at heart, but now just really wanted peace. And now it was the time of the revolution, and uh, he was very peace-loving. But the war ended up coming to his farm. And when it came to his farm, uh, Colonel William Tavington was there, who was a a quintessential bad guy uh, in this movie. He's the same guy. He plays bad guy in everything, uh, and he's a good bad guy. And he comes, and um, uh, his oldest son, uh, Benjamin Martin's oldest son, Gabriel, had been, he was basically coming to kind of take him away because he had been a courier for uh, the American forces. And, and, uh, and so the young, one of the younger sons, not the youngest, but one of the younger sons named Thomas really didn't want Gabriel taken away. And so Thomas ends up kind of rushing and trying to help save his brother, and he's just a kid. And Colonel Tavington just kills him, just kills him right there, and then reminds him that he's a stupid boy. Just killed him. Well, it brought Mel Gibson's character, Benjamin Martin, to a place where he decided that action was going to have to be the way that he was going to go. And so he basically formed a militia, and the militia kept attacking uh, the Redcoats in different places, and they ended up calling him, Benjamin Martin, the ghost, because they could never capture him. They could never take him, and he would show up kind of unnoticed and, and, uh, and wreak havoc. And so there was a time a little bit later on in the movie where after, you know, they had killed a number of the Redcoats, and they kept many of their uniforms, and they, they actually set them up on a faraway hill uh, as scarecrows. Uh, they stuffed them, and they made them look like they were really there. And some of uh, Benjamin Martin's men had been captured, and so Benjamin Martin came in to negotiate the release of his prisoners by, uh, by basically offering a swap for some of the officers that he had. He didn't have any. They, they were all dead, but he, uh, he had their uniforms. And so he was negotiating with, uh, with the general, Cornwallis, and uh, after that negotiation, he runs into kind of for the first time face-to-face Colonel Tavington that had killed his son. And this is where you pick it up in the movie, and I want you just to get a breath of this uh, from the movie The Patriot. General, what is this? Prisoner exchange. He has 18 of our officers. Who is he? I recognize him. He's the commander of the militia. Your ghost. Say that sword, Colonel! He rode in under a white flag for a formal parley. This is madness. If you harm him, you condemn our officers. General, with respect, sir. He's killed as many officers in the last two months. He has shown no aggression here. Hence, he cannot be touched. Has he not? You! Are you all the ghost, are you? I remember you and that farm, that stupid little boy. Did he die? You know, it's an ugly business doing one's duty. But just occasionally, it's a real pleasure. Before this war's over, I'm going to kill you. Why wait? And I'm reminded when I see the intensity of that scene that I do not want to be on the wrong side of Benjamin Martin. 
You know, never underestimate um, the power of a father who is basically doing what he's doing now for the vindication of his son. And this is what I see in this, and it reminds me. And, and what Benjamin Martin wanted more than anything was just peace. From the very outset, he wanted peace, but he was forced into enacting justice. And never underestimate the power of what a father wants to do in vindicating his son. That thought should never be far from you on Palm Sunday. And so when we arrive at that space of Palm Sunday in the way that Luke is teaching this to Theophilus in Luke chapter 19 and on into Luke chapter 20, this is an idea that's going to walk with us for a while. After many words and many stories that Luke has told up to this point, and we've been traveling with Luke now for weeks and weeks and weeks, and it's been a good journey. We've learned a significant amount from Luke's brilliance of weaving together the story of Jesus and teaching us about the uniqueness of who Jesus was. He was showing that Jesus was God the Son, but he was also demonstrating, even through the early hints in the Gospel of Luke, that God the Son, Jesus the Messiah, would ultimately be rejected. I mean, when we're reading in the very narratives after Jesus' birth, when Mary and Joseph run into a man named Simeon in the temple, and Simeon says functionally that this boy is going to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel, and he is going to pierce your heart too, Mary. He was un helping them understand from the very outset, and Luke was helping us to understand from the very outset that Jesus ultimately would be in a place of rejection. When we see Jesus at Nazareth after he has begun his ministry and now he's, he's, uh, he's in his own hometown and he's preaching the gospel there, what happened ultimately after he preaches and he says, hey, today this, this passage from Isaiah about the Messiah has been fulfilled in your hearing. And what did they do? They rejected him right there from the outset and they wanted to throw him off a cliff, but God knew it wasn't time yet and so he walked on through the crowd. Then when you get into Luke chapter 11, you see the Pharisees and their desire to capture and to stump Jesus. And ultimately, we see that they wanted to kill him. And Jesus pronounces woes over them and actually insults them in some ways because he understands exactly what they're trying to do and that ultimately Jesus would be rejected even by the teachers and the Pharisees and the elders of Israel. So you know the story. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem for what would be ultimately the last time. He's coming for the last Passover. Every year he would come to Jerusalem during the time of Passover, and here he is coming into the city um, for the Passover. You remember the story. He went and he got a donkey. He told his disciples to get this donkey, and they said, well, what are we going to tell him? Are we just going to go get him? Are we going to steal him? Uh, if they ask, what are you doing? He said, just tell him the, the Lord needs it. Remember, this wasn't his first time being in Jerusalem. He had friends all over the place. He had friends in Bethany, and he had friends in Jerusalem. He had people that he knew. This probably wasn't just no, you know, it, nobody. Jesus probably knew where he could get this. And so there he sits on a donkey coming in in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9, which talks about the Messiah coming in to Jerusalem on a donkey. And Jesus does that very thing, and you know what's happening, right? Palm branches and people that are throwing their cloaks on the road and welcoming him in as, uh, as Messiah and cheering for him and shouting Hosanna as we were even singing about just a moment ago. But then listen to Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 37. It says this. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet... The stones will cry out. Now, I know when we read this passage, we may be lost on a few uh, pieces of this. First of all, what the disciples are doing is they're quoting from Psalm chapter 118. This was a messianic psalm of sorts, and they were quoting and shouting out from it, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right out of Psalm 118. And the Pharisees who want Jesus to just stop all the madness because people are shouting as if he's, you know, as if he's the Messiah or something, 
And they're saying, teacher, you need to rebuke your disciples because they're actually now shouting and and giving praise to you as if you're the Messiah and quoting from the scripture that's pointing to the Messiah as if you're the Messiah. He said, the Pharisee said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said, I'm telling you the truth. If they don't do this, the stones are going to cry out. Now, there is something to be said for the fact that we should never let creation take our place in praising God. Creation itself is praising God, but we should never let it be a replacement for our praise from God. There's no doubt that we should be people who are constantly and consistently worshiping and praising the one who has set us free. Without a doubt, this passage actually speaks to that, but it speaks to more than just that. When Jesus is saying, if they're silent, I'm telling you, the stones are going to cry out. He's not just saying that the stones will praise me too. He's saying something even richer and deeper and maybe even slightly more foreboding for us. In fact, if we continue on in our passage there in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says these words. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes, and the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, Jesus actually, when he's saying, if they're silent... They they said, hey, teacher, rebuke these disciples who are screaming out and praising you. And he said, if they're silent, I'm telling you, the rocks are going to cry out. In other words, he's saying creation itself will testify to the fact that I am the one who has made all of these things. But he's also pointing to the fact that as he looks over Jerusalem, that there is coming a time because of the rejection of people like the Pharisees and elders and teachers of the law and other people as well. There were other people, just common Israelites at that time, who had rejected him. Because of that rejection, Jesus looks over the city and weeps and says, if you would have only known that this was the time of God's visitation to you, that I have come here for you to rescue you, to redeem you, yet you've rejected me. And now as a result of you rejecting me, here's what's going to happen. In a time to come, and it happened in 70 AD under General Titus of the Romans, Jerusalem was ransacked, the temple was ransacked, and and in a very strict and almost literal sense, not one stone was left upon another. And Jesus is saying, if you reject me, I'm telling you right now that the stones are going to cry out because not one of them will be left on another one because you've chosen to reject the coming of God to you and you have not recognized the time of his visitation. It's a significant reminder for us of the seriousness of what Jesus was coming to do and that this was really hemmed up in the idea, this Palm Sunday idea was hemmed up in the idea that Jesus was going to be a man of sorrows and one who was going to be rejected. Right after that scene, what Luke does is he shows us Jesus going into the temple area in Jerusalem and cleansing the temple. You remember that story. And the cleansing of the temple actually functioned for Luke as not only a literal event that held significant spiritual meaning, but it was also a living parable of what God was ultimately going to do in and through this process, that he was going to to cleanse this city, cleanse this temple, and he was doing this through his own son, Jesus. And then following that, when you get into Luke chapter 20, you see Jesus interacting with the Pharisees and the teacher of the law now in Jerusalem for this last Passover week. And they're trying to quiz him and question him because ultimately they wanted to see him dead. And so they ask him a question about John's baptism, and Jesus answers their question with a question, which he's always really good at doing. He's like, you're not not driving this conversation. I'll answer your question with a question. And then they were stumped, and they're like, we can't answer this question. If we say this, that's not going to work. If we say this, that's not going to work. It's because Jesus was brilliant. You never want to get, here's the thing. Why would you want to get into an argument with the Son of God? I mean, if you're going to pick a debate, pick someone else. Because not only can he do whatever he wants, he's also the smartest 
human being who was divine, but the smartest person whose feet have ever walked the planet. Smarter than anyone at any time for any reason. Smarter than everyone at exactly the same time. And you want to debate with him. I mean, even in your walk a day life, you want to debate with him sometimes on things that you know he said and you know he's already told you and you want to debate with him. Like you're smarter than him. Like I'm smarter than him. I've debated him before. And then I've just walked away going, I think I did pretty well. (laughs) And then when I came to my senses, I realized I'm an idiot. What am I thinking? So what Jesus does is he he basically doesn't answer that question. He says, I'm not going to tell you by what authority I'm doing all of these things. That's what they wanted to know. But then he functionally does answer their question with a parable. And here's what the parable um, helps us to see. In Luke chapter 20, verse number 9, it says, He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. They planned this. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and then the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So Jesus tells this story in the presence of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the elders who had been in the process of planning his demise. And he tells this story for a few different reasons. Now, you've got to remember that this is one of the easier stories or parables to interpret. Of all the parables that we have, this one for the Jewish ears that were listening to it would have been really, really easy to understand, right? Let me break it down for you. So you have a vineyard owner, right? He's the guy who owns everything. That would be God. Then you have uh, what he talks about in here as tenants or people that have been given an opportunity to rent the property and care for it and all that kind of stuff. That's basically um, the, the the religious leaders and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who have that responsibility. Then he talks about a vineyard. The vineyard is Israel. Remember, in Isaiah chapter 5, he references this. Here's what it says. Isaiah chapter 5, uh, verse number 1 says... The vineyard of, or verse number seven says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. So he says it very plainly. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is, is Israel, right? So the vineyard is the people of Israel. Then he talks about um, the tenants. I've already said those are Pharisees, teachers of the law. Then he talks about the servants, those people that he sent. He sent one, two, three servants to them. Well, who were those? Those were the prophets. People like, uh, for instance, people like Elijah, who got sent to a people who got rejected. People like, say, Zechariah, who got sent to a people who got rejected. People like Jeremiah, who got sent to a people and got rejected. Many of them beaten. One of them killed, actually, but beaten and left for dead and rejected. And this is the owner who is sending his servants into the vineyard to make clear to them what his instructions are and what he wants to do. And they reject not one, not two, not three. And so the owner says, they've rejected the prophets. I will send them the son whom I love. Does that language sound familiar, by the way? Do you remember that from the baptism of Jesus? This is my son whom I love. Do you think Luke is making some accidental statement here when he's telling this story? No. He knows exactly what he's saying. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he says, I will send them the son whom I love. Maybe they will respect him. But instead, they talk the matter over. They plot his demise. This isn't something that just accidentally happens. They say, if we kill him, he's the heir. Maybe we'll have this thing all to ourselves. And so that's exactly what they did. They threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. So Jesus is telling this story, not only giving them advance notice for what he knows is about to befall him, but he's also giving them a heads up 
that he knows exactly what they are doing. He tells this story, and he is nailing them to the wall. He knows what they're doing, that this rejection is coming. He knows how it's coming. He knows what they're plotting. And he's basically saying, don't think that you've got this thing covered up or can outsmart me. And by the way, they did try and cover this thing up. The Jewish leaders basically tried to wash their hands of it, and they, they kind of moved it over into the realm of Pontius Pilate, if you remember, later on in this week. And Pontius Pilate tried to wash his hands of it, but it didn't work very well. But they ended up saying, well, we're not allowed by our law, but they're the ones who were trying to get this thing going. And so they ended up making that happen and trying to cover it up. Jesus is basically saying, I know exactly what's going on, and I know what's going to befall me, but I want to remind you guys of something. I want to remind you of what's going to befall you. Listen to the next verse. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, may this never be. Another translation says, God forbid. When the people heard this, they said, may this never be. Here's what you know when you're, when you're listening to this story. Here's what you know, that the people who were hearing it, they knew exactly what was being said. Because then they're saying, may this never be. Jesus tells the story and basically says, here's what's happening. The owner of the vineyard gave it to some tenants, Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the elders of the law, in this vineyard called Israel. And they were there, and so he sent some servants to say he wanted some fruit of the land. He wanted, he wanted to, to understand and sense that these people were walking in the right way of God. And so he sends them not one, not two, not three servants, but then ultimately they're rejected, but also he sends his own son. But the son they didn't just beat up. The son they killed. But then Jesus says, here's what the owner is going to do. The owner is going to make sure that he deals with those who have rejected and killed the son. Here's what I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to miss the fact that in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is teaching us something significant, and he goes on to even get a little more laser clear. Look in verse number 17. It says, Jesus looked directly at them. After telling this whole story, he looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, you think? But they were afraid of the people. It's interesting what Jesus does here. When Jesus is making his way into the city, the disciples are crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What are they doing? They're quoting Psalm 118. And when Jesus is now faced with the dilemma of those who are rejecting him, the Pharisees and teachers of the law and the scribes and the elders, and he's telling this parable about a son that is sent because the prophets were rejected, and that the son was killed and that God's going to deal with them, he ends up now quoting from Psalm 118 to them and says, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Now, some of your translations say it has become the cornerstone. Here's the thing. In the language that we're understanding and we're reading, there is basically a word that is almost interchangeable for both capstone and cornerstone. They are not exactly the same thing, but there is a word that can be used for either one. So either one of those translations works well. In fact, the reason that it works well is because in verse 18, remember Jesus said this, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and the one on whom it falls will be crushed. Remember this, here's what a cornerstone was. A cornerstone was the one that was set on the very foundation. It was the corner of the building. The building took shape because of where the cornerstone was placed and because of the shape of the cornerstone. It is the one that helped fit everything together. It is the stone that, that held everything together, basically. It is the firm foundation, and it was the first one to be laid. And so Jesus makes the statement. He says, everyone who falls on this stone, remember he himself is saying, I'm the stone the builders rejected, and it has become the cornerstone. He says, anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But then he says, and the one on whom it falls 
will be crushed. That gives you the idea of a capstone because the capstone was the top part of the building. And the capstone was something that would go on the top. It was designed for beauty and for majesty. Sometimes it was the one that was encrusted in gold. It was the one when people came up to the building that they could see and that they could pick out and know that this is a significant thing. And so sometimes it was in an arch. And so you would have a capstone on an arch. And so the idea here is both cornerstone and capstone are in view. You can fall on the cornerstone and the capstone can fall on you. Why is that important for us? It's important for us, I think, for this reason, because the scripture reminds us that the stone the builders rejected has become both the cornerstone and the capstone. It is referring to Jesus Christ being the one who is the framework, because here's what Jesus did. Jesus came to his own, and his own rejected him. Jesus came and preached a message of the gospel and represented God, and yet the ones who were the brokers of all things God and who held the law in their hands and who were experts in that, they rejected him because they didn't think he looked right. The builder said, no, nope, this isn't the right stone. Then Luke chronicles for us Jesus who stilled storms, who raised the dead, who preached the kingdom of God, who freed people from sickness, who cast demons out of people. He, co he communicates all this about Jesus, and yet here's what we find. He is ultimately rejected. But here's what I want to remind you of. Listen very close to what I'm about to tell you. Don't miss this. It's a big idea of the message. Rejection of Jesus has grave consequences because God the Father will vindicate God the Son. Rejection of Jesus has grave consequences because I assure you, God the Father will vindicate God the Son. Now, I'm not talking about just simple avenging. What you have when we saw the Patriot, you had kind of an idea of a bit of avenging the death of his son but if you look at it closely in the movie, you also see the idea of vindicating his son's death, that it wasn't in vain, so to speak. So here, here's what I want to remind you, this concept of God's revenge. Remember, the Bible says, revenge is mine, says the Lord. It is mine to repay, right? God's the one who will settle accounts. God's the one who will deal with people. But the idea of God's vengeance can actually be kind of subsumed under the big umbrella of God's vindication of his son. In other words, God is going to show the world that even though his son was rejected, that he was still the son of God, that he was still the Messiah, that he did everything perfectly right, and that one day the world is going to see that this is the one who was rejected, but that he himself is actually the cornerstone and the capstone. He's the one who holds everything together. He's the one that keeps it all together, and he is the one who is the beautiful crowning piece of everything that God is demonstrating to humanity. This is what God will do. In fact, we see it over and over and over in the scripture. If you look in Isaiah chapter 28, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. If you see Isaiah chapter 28, you see this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. And the one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. Why do we have that? Here's why. Because Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. The stone the builders rejected is the cornerstone. And God Almighty, the Father, is going to vindicate the Son. 1 Peter chapter 2 says it this way. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. This is in there because Jesus Christ, the one the builders rejected, is the stone, and he becomes the cornerstone, and God the Father will vindicate God the Son. 
Ephesians chapter 2 says it this way. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That is there because Jesus is the stone the builders rejected and he has become the cornerstone and God the Father is going to vindicate God the Son. Colossians chapter 1 says it this way. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Why is that there? Because he's the stone. He's the one the builders rejected, but he has become the cornerstone. And God the Father is going to vindicate God the Son. But he's not only referred to as the cornerstone, we also see him as the capstone. Look in Acts chapter number four, it says this. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Why is that there? Because the stone the builders rejected has become the gorgeous capstone that reminds us that salvation is found in no one else, and God the Father will vindicate God the Son. I can't believe I'm still seated. Colossians chapter 1 says it this way. It says that Jesus is the head of the body, the church, and he's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Why is that there? Because Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, who has become the capstone. And we see in him that he is the supremacy above every single thing that exists because God the Father will take the stone the builders rejected and will vindicate that stone his son. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says it this way, being found in in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Why is that there? Because he's the stone the builders rejected that became the capstone, gleaming above all things, and at his name every knee will bow every tongue will confess because God the Father will vindicate God the Son. I need some water. But here's the thing. Sometimes the scripture actually refers to both in the same breath. Capstone and cornerstone. Listen to what Revelation chapter number one says. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. You see, the cornerstone is the first stone laid. The capstone is the last stone laid. And Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the cornerstone and the capstone because God the Father is reminding us that the stone the builders rejected, he is going to vindicate. This is something we need to be reminded of. Why do I tell you all of these things? I tell you because it is a dangerous thing for people to reject the Son. Because rejection of the Son has grave consequences because God the Father will vindicate God the Son. That's part of what we learn on Palm Sunday. What we learn on Palm Sunday is this. Rejection is not forever when it comes to Jesus. Rejection is not forever. Not only is it not forever for him because God the Father is going to vindicate God the Son. Even though he has been the stone that the builders rejected. 
This is not the right kind of stone. This is not what we need. God says, it is the right stone. It is what you need. And I will see to it that the stone the builders rejected becomes the cornerstone and the capstone at the same time. He is going to be the one that every eye will see and and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even though he faced this rejection, he will be rejected no more because everyone will recognize He is king of every king and lord of every lord. And as he came in on Palm Sunday, people waving palm branches saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Their trust in him, it will be vindicated. So not only, listen, not only will the son be vindicated by the father through his period of rejection and set up as the cornerstone and the capstone, but every single person who puts their trust in him, no matter how often you have been rejected for your faith, you will be vindicated by the Father as well. This is a great reminder to people who face struggle, persecution, who face mocking. Now, do we face that a lot in the United States? Not near, not near, not even comparable to what we find in places that I've been in all places of the world. Not even comparable. We might get mocked. We may not get a promotion. We may not get invited over to the dinner. Our family may think we're just nuts or crazy and tell us so and do all that stuff. Because of our faith in Jesus, we may, and listen, all of those things still hurt. There's all that emotional pain that goes with it. I totally understand and I totally get it. But there are some places in the world when you choose Jesus, you can die. You can be killed. You can be jailed. You can have all of your life taken away from you, your family, your friends, everything. You can be exiled. You can be treated as dead even if you're not dead. This goes on in many places. But the word to all of us, us and them, is this. Our faith in Jesus will be vindicated by the Father. Because the stone the builders rejected... It's become the cornerstone and the capstone. He is the foundation. He's the one who holds everything together. And he is the glorious, beautiful presence of God in bodily form that we all see and recognize and understand that he alone is the savior of the world. So regardless of what happened, his rejection is not forever. Regardless of what happens with you, your rejection is not forever. God will vindicate those of us who have been rejected by the world or by family or by friends in the name of Jesus, he will vindicate that one day because we will show up with him. We will be revealed with him. It's going to be a beautiful picture. But I want to say this to you before we leave. There may be some of you in this place that are people who have suffered with rejection because of your faith. Other people may have suffered rejection for a number of other different reasons, but this text really lends itself to talk about being rejected because of our faith. Know this, that your faith will be be vindicated, that there's coming a time where you, you you don't have to be the one to thumb your nose at anybody or say na, 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 or anything like that to anybody. That's not our heart because what God wants is he wants us in the meantime, even if we're facing rejection, to still carry on the mission that Jesus has given us, and that is this. We have a world to love. We have a people to serve. We have a story to tell. This is what God has called us to. But there may be some of you in this room who have never come to the place of actually surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. And you say, well, yeah, but you know, Jerry, but I've never rejected him. Listen, passive indifference is rejection. Passive indifference to him is rejection. Because you know the gospel now. You're you're hearing the testimony that there is only salvation is found in no one else other than Jesus. And if you're passive about that, then fundamentally you're choosing rejection. Passive indifference is no excuse. Even if it's not outright rebellion and outright rejection, so to speak, it's no excuse. And know this, whatever's going on inside of your heart, if you think that you can be your own Lord, your own boss, your own ruler, you're sadly mistaken. You're sadly mistaken. I want to remind you of this. Rejection of Jesus has grave consequences, not because God wants it that way. See, Jesus went to a cross to die for your sin. 
He went to a cross to die for your sin, your junk, your mess that keeps you separated from God. He went to a cross to die for that, to pay a debt that you could never pay. You had no chance by yourself. If it was all up to you, it's like, I'm gonna get to God some way, good luck. It's not happening, ever, ever, in a million lifetimes, it's not happening. But Jesus did it on your behalf because he loves the world. Because he came willingly, not by force. The father didn't say, I'm gonna make you do it. No, he said, this is what the father and I agree are the, is the best option. This is what we want to do. And so he comes in love and he comes in joy and says, I wanna give my life for you. I want you to be reconciled to the father. I want you to know him. I want you to have peace and recognize the time of God's coming to you. Amen. This is what he's saying to you. But if you reject him, rejection has grave consequences because God the Father will vindicate his son. So I say to you, receive Jesus, not because of your fear. Receive Jesus because you've never had anyone love you like this. Never. Nobody's ever loved you like this. God the Father will vindicate God the Son. The stone the builders rejected, the stone that you have rejected, has become the cornerstone and the capstone and salvation is found in no one else. Would you bow your heads with me? We're gone in just a moment. If you don't have to move, I'd ask you not to. In kindness to the people around you. If you're here and you've never before entrusted your life to Jesus Christ, then I wanna encourage you to receive Jesus. Simply put, I'm not gonna twist your arm I'm not going to force you into anything. But if you know that you need to do business with God and you need to get your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you, you, you need by faith to enter into that relationship. Then when we dismiss in just a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to leave it up to you. When we dismiss, if you're at our Lockport campus watching, Pastor Jonathan's going to give you instruction of who to connect with and how. If you're here on this campus, I'm going to ask you to come by the fireside room. There's some pastors there, some prayer partners there. They'd love to talk to you about what it means to receive Jesus. Because I, I say this message to you today because this is a part of what we learned from Palm Sunday. That as Jesus enters Jerusalem, ultimately what he's going to face is he's going to face rejection. He's the stone the builders rejected. But he became the cornerstone, the capstone. He's the one who holds it all together. Salvation's found in no one else. And if you want to know what it means to have your sins forgiven, your life transformed, Christ living in you, and to be reconciled to the Father, you can do that by receiving Jesus. So when we dismiss in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come by the fireside room. Don't leave this place without settling the issue of knowing Jesus personally. If you're in this room or in the East Worship Center, just come, come over to the fireside room. Let us talk to you about what it means to know Christ. Father, thank you for your word and for the reminder in this season, even on Palm Sunday, what it was like for Jesus to enter in and be cheered by his own disciples, but ultimately to be undermined by some teachers and rulers in that day and age and, and certainly other people at large as well. And Father, I pray that we would be reminded that the rejection of Jesus is not ever going to be final because he will be vindicated. You love the son you sent, and you will vindicate the name of Jesus, and it will be known, every eye will see and know that this is the one true Lord. Father, I pray that for those that are here that may have never before really understood what it means to bow their heart and bow their knee and surrender themselves to God through Jesus, that they would find mercy and find grace and find love that knows no bounds. Father, I pray that you, they would sense the compelling love of God in Jesus Christ on a cross, dying for their sins so that they could have access to you. But Father, I know unless we appropriate that by faith, we'll never experience it. So Father, for those that need to know what it means to have a relationship with you, that the Spirit of God is drawing to you, I pray that they would have the strength, the courage, the willingness 
to be able to walk into a room across this atrium or to walk up to Pastor Jonathan at the Lockport campus and be able to simply say, I need Jesus. I want to receive Jesus. And that they would have new life. So, Father, I trust you to do that, and I pray you would give us grace in this week to be able to be sensitive to the people around us that need to know Jesus that we might be able to bring with us Friday night or even this upcoming Sunday to worship with us and to hear the good news that human beings, as sinful as they are, can be forgiven and reconciled to God through the gift of Jesus' death and resurrection. You have vindicated your son in part through the resurrection and through the ascension. But there is going to come a final vindication when Jesus comes again. And we long for that day and are reminded that even those of us who have been rejected because of our faith will finally and fully be vindicated because of your son, the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone and the capstone. We trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to you.